first of all, let me just, I did a handout which is sort of tangential to my paper. Um, I didn't know quite how many copies to do, so let me just take my class and just keep on copying my handout. <coughs> Okay, um, I've timed this paper twice, and each time it was different, so um, I may not quite get to the end. Um, it is, anyway, um, drawn from um, a book I'm in the process of finishing at the moment on Freud, called Freud and the Scene of Trauma, uh, and it's about the role of trauma in Freud's thought, <coughs> and in particular, um, beginning with his encounter with Charcot, his um, commitment to Charcot, his break from Charcot, and then working right through to Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in the way in which uh, the model of trauma in Freud's thought is developed and complicated, and is in fact quite different from the way it's standardly represented um, in the more simplified narratives of the history of Freud's thought. Um, <clears throat> and um, in particular, I'm interested in the way it, and this is a, an insight that I, I draw from the work of Jean Laplanche, the way in which it lives on, even after the so-called uh, repudiation or abandonment of the theory of traumatic seduction, the way in which it lives on in Freud's work and returns again and again in, in displaced and, and sometimes quite explicit form, um, obviously right up to the very end uh, with the book on Moses and monotheism, where you get an extraordinary recapitulation of the, uh, of the trauma theory, but again and again in... Um, in explicit form again in the Wolfman case, in disguised form in the Leonardo case study. Um, I'm going to concentrate um, on certain moments that I'm going to pull out of my argument. Um, I hope it won't appear too disconnected. <coughs> um, on um, basically the work of the 1890s. But I've schematized um, in the handout um, in, a, in, a, in a very simplified way um, some of the time schemas or temporal schemas uh, that you find in different texts of Freud from 1893 through to <coughs> the whole um, screen memories problematic. Okay. Um, <coughs> this opening section is I'm calling scenographies. And it's got a little epigraph from the Letters to Fleece. Everything goes back to the reproduction of scenes. Everything goes back to the reproduction of scenes. Okay. <clears throat> On January the 24th, 1897, at the high point of his commitment to the theory of infantile seduction as the cause of the major forms of psychopathology, Freud wrote to his intimate friend and long-term correspondent, Wilhelm Fleiss, quote, The early period before the age of one and a quarter years is becoming ever more significant. Thus, I was able to trace back, with certainty, a hysteria that developed in the context of a periodic mild depression to a seduction, which occurred for the first time at 11 months. And I could hear again the words that were exchanged between two adults at that time. It was as though it comes from a phonograph. It was as though it comes from a phonograph. It's an extraordinary claim but not for its postulation of traumatic after-effects resulting from very early sexual abuse, nothing surprising there, nor even for its confidence in obtaining such detailed information about a long past event. <coughs> Freud's claim is extraordinary because of its form. This goes beyond the postulation of a causal event impacting on the organism in the form of visible damage, as in traditional medical models of, of physical trauma. The word literally means a wound or break in the organism's skin surface or boundaries. And it's different from the neurological models, say, of Charcot, <coughs> where shocks to the nervous system produced a range of belated contractures, paralyses, anesthesias, and where the prototypical accident here is the railway accident. In these models of trauma, the explanation involves a relatively direct cause and effect relation, even if, as in Charcot's model of traumatic hysteria, the symptoms appeared belatedly after a time lapse or incubation period. What we have here, however, are not so much the after-effects of a causal event in the past as the activity in the present of a scene, a scene played out with all the immediacy of a present event. In the above instance, it takes the form of an adult dialogue that could not even have been understood, let alone remembered in any ordinary sense of the word, by an infant of 11 months. Nevertheless, Freud claims, a dialogue is reproduced with such vividness, quote, as though it comes from a phonograph. We're not told 
through the medium of what inscriptions this happens, although Freud calls it a case of epileptiform convulsions, thus indicating the presenting symptoms. Unlike the railway accident, what is involved is not just the shock of a physical impact and its accompanying affect of fright, but the human and signifying effect of other persons, their interactions and intentions, however opaque or incomprehensible. In a letter four months later, <coughs> in April 97, Freud comments that what had previously escaped him about historical fantasies was that they often, quote, go back to things children overhear at an early age and understand only subsequently, nachträglich is the German. The age at which they take on any information of this kind is, strangely enough, six to seven months on. Here, it is the exciting but incomprehensible speech of adults that implants the tra traumatic seed of later hysteria. Where the emphasis in the above scene is on hearing and exchanged words, other scenes that Freud retells to Fleece have the visual dimensions of a tableau. <clears throat> and I quote, The intrinsic authenticity of infantile trauma is borne out by the following little incident, which the patient claims to have observed as a three-year-old child. She goes into a darkened room where her mother is carrying on and eavesdrops. She has good reasons for identifying with this mother. Now, I'll actually uh, excerpt those, those reasons, but we can return to them later if people are interested. The mother now stands in the room and shouts, Rotten criminal, what do you want from me? I will have no part of that. Just whom do you think you have in front of you? Then she tears the clothes from her body with one hand, while with the other she presses them against it, which creates a very peculiar impression. Then she stares at a certain spot in the room, her face contorted with rage, covers her genitals with one hand, and pushes something away with the other. Then she raises both hands, claws at the air, and bites it. Shouting and cursing, she bends over far backward. Again, she covers her genitals with her hand, whereupon she falls over forward, so that her head almost touches the floor. Finally, she quietly falls over backwards onto the floor. Afterwards, she wrings her hands, sits down in a corner, and with her features distorted with pain, she weeps. For the child, the most conspicuous phase is when the mother, standing up, is bent over forward. She sees that the mother keeps her toes strongly turned inward." Unquote. Freud's reason for retelling this terrible scene is its confirmation of the authenticity of infantile trauma, of the perverse and often violent scenes that featured in so many of his analyses. At least three moments are linked together here. First, the enigmatic tableau that the mother enacts and on which the small child uncomprehendingly stumbles. Secondly, the shadowy primal scene, as I'll call it, behind the frozen moment of the mother's tableau. Thirdly, its persistence and retelling now in the present moment of the analysis by the adult daughter. A fourth moment can also be postulated, that of Freud's retelling to Fleece, affirming once again the reality of infantile trauma in the attempt to resolve his uncertainty about the status of these scenes as real events or fantasies. However, there is more to the letter than a move in a theoretical debate, or rather the latter is in part driven by Freud's palpable need to pass this haunting scene on to someone else, to unburden himself and bear witness to its distress. He ends the letter with a quotation from Goethe's Mignon, a new motto, what has been done to you, poor child? Enough of my filthy stories. The scene in the darkened room remembered by the daughter is the mother's acting out of a tableau which has an arrested or fixated quality. Something is being repeated that one feels has been repeated many times before, like a compulsive ritual. In her solitude, the mother is nevertheless not alone, for she addresses and cries out against an absent presence. The small witness does not understand what is happening, but her attention is drawn to certain conspicuous details, such as her mother's toes turned strongly inward, to a certain action of the hands, Quote, which creates a very peculiar impression. The mother's postures and gestures are enigmatic signs whose meanings are not spoken but acted out, but which seem to belong elsewhere to another scene, an andere Schauplatz, whose violence shadows the repetitive tableau in the darkened room, and where those puzzling signs would regain some of their lost meaning, if not their origins. <coughs> 
Freud attempts to read this tableau and its foreclosed meanings through both the uncomprehending gaze of the child and the retrospective narration of this now grown up patient with an attention and expectation attuned by his understanding of the hysterical attack derived from Charcot's model of traumatic hysteria and elaborated by Breuer and himself in their studies on hysteria published almost two years previously in 1895. In this early account, the attack, <coughs> in particular, the attack is elaborated by Charcot in four stages, of which the third stage is what he calls attitude passionnelle, uh, which uh, uh, Freud um, translates as scenes of passionate movement. This is understood as the reproduction of a scene, which is assumed to be both the moment of the historical symptoms' first appearance and therefore their origin. In the course of the intervening two years, Freud's developing account of hysteria had dislocated this direct causal connection in ways that we will consider later, but which still anchored it in a specifiable traumatic event of external origin. <coughs> Quote, Can one doubt that the father forces the mother to submit to anal intercourse? Can one not recognise in the mother's historical attack the separate phases of the assault? First the attempt to get at her from the front, then pressing her down from the back and penetrating between her legs, which force her to turn her feet inward. Finally, how does the patient know that in attacks one usually enacts both persons, self-injury, self-murder, as occurred here, in that the woman tears off her clothes with one hand, like the assailant, and with the other holds on to them, as she herself did at the time. Unquote. The only apparent meaninglessness of the mother's distraught behaviour, her speech to an hallucinated other person, makes sense for Freud as the reproduction of an earlier scene of sexual violence, of marital assault, which he reconstructs through its repetitions, the layers and relays of its transmission. What governs Freud's selection of clinical material for retelling to Fleece is a concern with what he calls the authenticity of the traumatic tableau witnessed by the child and its relation to its other scene. Freud reads the mother's postures as the signs of particular forms of adult sexual assault, first frontal and finally from the rear, which would be unintelligible to the child. Even more telling for Freud are the mother's gestures, so striking and peculiar for the child, which exemplify a crucial fact about the processes of identification in play in a hysterical attack. Quote, how does the patient know that in attacks one usually enacts both persons, as occurred here? This feature of the clinical material is significant at this point for Freud because it appears to confirm the scene's authenticity, to bear witness to psychological processes that the child, and later the analysand, would have no knowledge of. Freud's wondering question implies how could she reproduce such telling details unless she had actually witnessed such a scene, which itself bears traces, signs, of an even earlier scene. Consequently, he concludes, both that his patient had witnessed a scene, as a child the scene she describes her mother performing, and that such a scene itself bears testimony through its form and significant details to an earlier scene of which the child is not aware, <coughs> but which can be inferred from the fixated, repetitive response of its adult victim. Freud's focus in the letter is not on the child's experience of abuse, which he refers to uh, in, in passing, but to her witnessing of her mother's scene of hallucinatory repetition. Of course, Freud is writing a compressed clinical anecdote in a private letter and not a publicly presented and elaborated case study, so we have no access to the daughter's own network of associations and emotions connected with the incident. What is so striking about the anecdote and prefigures the argument of my book is the structure of repetition in which a past moment is not so much the absent past cause of present effects, but is acted out and appears to be immediately present and alive as a current event. <clears throat> and it's that form of repetition that, um, that uh, I come back to again and again, which I think Freud struggled with again and again, right up to the final essay, uh, a late essay, um, Constructions in Analysis. One of the surprising things about this, this second letter uh, <coughs> that I've read out uh, is its date, December the 22nd, 1897. <clears throat> in the 11 months between it in the letter I began by quoting, the, the letter of the phonograph, Freud had written his famous repudiation of his seduction theory on September 21st, 97, giving Fleece four reasons why he no longer believed in the scenes of early child sexual abuse on which the chains of association and inference in his clinical cases seemed to converge. 
Even more striking is that in a series of letters in October and November of that year, Freud formulates the germ of the Oedipus complex, complete with references to <coughs> Sophocles, Oedipus, and Shakespeare's Hamlet, <coughs> in a letter to Fleece, of infantile uh, pregenital sexuality of normal, i.e. non-traumatic repression, which would replace the seduction theory and become the cornerstone of classical Freudian psychoanalysis. Yet here, once again, in December, some months after this, the letter of repudiation, we find Freud compelled by the structure of scenic repetition, by the relay from scene to scene, to reaffirm what he calls the intrinsic authenticity of infantile trauma in the face of his own previous objections. As the letters to Fleece through the late 1890s testify, despite the infamous, <coughs> sorry, the famous repudiation and turning point of September 97, Freud returns again and again to the hypothesis of an originally traumatic event and an uncovering of later scenes in which it appears to be encoded. As late as January the 8th, 1900, <coughs> at the time of the publication of the uh, Interpretation of Dreams, Freud is writing, and I quote, in E's case, the second genuine scene is coming up after years of preparation, and it is one which may perhaps be confirmed objectively by asking his elder sister. Behind it, a third long-suspected scene approaches, unquote. And that's in 1900. <clears throat> we have the same palimpsestic structure of scene upon scene, and the same patience as of an archaeologist slowly uncovering sedimented layers and deposits. Two sentences previously Freud had written, in the evenings I read prehistory and the like, without any serious purpose. Even after his abandonment of the seduction theory announced privately to Fleece in September 97, <coughs> um, even after it had become public and official in 1906, Freud still pursues and seeks to reconstruct originary or primal scenes that operate with the force and structure of psychical traumas in case studies such as The Rat Man of 1909 and The Wolf Man of 1918. <coughs> The Planche and Pantalis were the first to point to this persistence of key elements of the abandoned theory in Freud's later work and to attempt a structural explanation of it, while Maria Torok and Nicholas Rand have traced a recurrent oscillation between fantasy and the external event in Freud's thought. The question <coughs> of the abandonment of the so-called seduction theory <coughs> is often described in terms of a simple turn or change of mind uh, from von Freud's part, from sexual seduction by an adult in childhood as a causal paradigm of eti or etiology for psychopathology, to Oedipal wishes and fantasies directed at the parents. Unfortunately, Freud himself is largely responsible for this misleadingly simplified account. The further he moved away from his earlier theory, both in time and in thought, the more he was prone to give a misleadingly polarised retrospect on his now long abandoned error and to present it in terms of a mutually exclusive opposition between fantasy and the real event. The history of the psychoanalytic movement of 1914, the autobiographical study of 1925 in particular, misrepresent both the complexity of the theory and the nature of the clinical materials on which it was based. On either side of the so-called theoretical break or turn of September 97, however, there is an array of close, <coughs> closely related concepts ranging from an increasingly complex model of trauma to the model of the screen memory, of primal fantasy, er fantasy, of originary fantasy, er sprungliche fantasy, and of transference, in which elements of memory and fantasy combine and repeat in different ways. In particular, in both trauma and the various forms of fantasy, what we find is the power of scenes, a certain scenography, its capacity to conscript the individual and to replicate itself at different levels of the psychical apparatus, generating a force of repetition a repetition compulsion that is to disrupt Freud's clinical practice and transform his metapsychology. <coughs> okay, I was going to say something about Charcot, but I'll skip that and move, move to a brief comment on um, <coughs> the uh, preliminary uh, communication of 1893 and its twin lecture, um, uh, which virtually repeats that. Um, but which uh, is, is attributed only to Freud, and which tends to assume a relatively straightforward relation between cause and symptom, which might seem plausible enough in the case of the traumatic hysterias consequent upon a physical trauma mm -hmm. or accident. By contrast, in common, <coughs> apparently non-traumatic hysteria, what is at stake, Freud says there, is not a single major event, but rather a series of affective impressions, a whole story of suffering. 
which attains the status of a trauma through summation. Even though the latter may be accessible only under hypnosis, it acts, quote, not indirectly through a chain of intermediate links, but as a directly releasing cause, unquote. This leads to the famous proposition that hysterics suffer mainly from reminiscences. Freud's tacit argument here is with Charcot's hereditarian model, which, is redu which reduced trauma to being simply an occasion, a precipitating cause, a vanishing agent provocateur, it's Charcot's favorite metaphor, um, that merely releases or activates the pre-given hereditary disposition. Charcot used the example of a blow on the knee that produces a tubercular inflammation in someone with a disposition to tuberculosis. <clears throat> Against this conception, Freud invokes what he calls, quote, another kind of causation, namely direct causation. He pictures this as, quote, a foreign body which continues to operate unceasingly as a stimulating cause of illness until it is got rid of, a metaphor that resonates with the new germ theory that was to displace the dominance of hereditarian explanations. This attribution of full causal dignity to the reproduced and acted out trauma, however, tends to collapse the very distinction between the precipitating cause in the moment of the symptom's first emergence and the determining cause, which for Charcot was a pre-given complex um, that was inherited, and for Freud at this point, um, something that remained to be elaborated. The specificity of the symptom is determined by the specificity of the traumatic moment of its emergence. For example, this is an example of Freud's, not Charcot's. A man watching his brother having his hip joint extended under anaesthetic hears the crack as the <coughs> joint gives way and instantly feels a pain in his own hip, which lasts for a year. <clears throat> Even where the determining relation is metaphorical or symbolic, vomiting produced by moral disgust, a headache produced by a piercing stare, the symptom finds its cause in a single originary moment. This may be complicated by the phenomenon of delay, the belated appearance in traumatic hysteria of paralysis after an incubation period, which is usually referred back by the patient to the previous accident. So despite the delay, Freud considers the causal connection to be a direct one. So the two texts of 1893, in both their examples and their general statements, offer the model of a direct cause and effect relation between a symptom and a traumatic event or emotional sequence. And they do this by raising trauma from its status as merely a releasing cause or agent provocateur to that of a direct specific cause uh, which uh, uh, survives as a still active foreign body. They thereby, they thereby evict a general non-specific heredity from its place in Charcot's schema as a prime determinant. Causal agency is concentrated in a single event or closely connected sequence, a single story of suffering. <clears throat> and this seems to be confirmed by the patient's affective acting out in the present, in those scenes of passionate movement or attitude passionale, which, when verbalized, appear to liquidate the symptom. The sensory and emotional intensity of the event in the present moment and its therapeutic liquidation of the symptom are taken by Freud as the guarantor of its historical identity with the originary trauma in the past. The historical accuracy of the patient's memories is assumed to be authenticated by therapeutic success, and both are correlated with the immediacy of the reproduced scene, dominated by a set of emotions that are alive and active in the present, just as they had been in the past. Now, in the years 1889 to 95, Freud's model of trauma inherited from Charcot was transformed from a neurological account with an important psychological component into one that was fully psychological. At the same time, its object was extended from hysteria to psychopathology in general, or what Freud in the years 94 to 96 called, quote, the neuropsychoses of defense, unquote. <coughs> the relatively simple cause and effect model that I've briefly sketched from the preliminary communication, and indeed for all its proliferation of symptoms in the Anna O case as well, <coughs> gradually evolves into a more complex time structure in which the initial traumatic scene is supplemented by a series of what Freud calls auxiliary scenes that orchestrate the production of symptoms. Freud's formulation of the seduction theory in the years immediately following the studies combines an increasingly exact specification of the sexual trauma uh, in, its un in its final unpublished version in the letters to Fleece. It narrows down to the figure of the perverse father <clears throat> so this, though he doesn't appear as such in the published uh, papers. But it also uh, involves the elaboration uh, of, of, a, of a quite complex temporal 
effectivity or mode of traumatic agency. As the multiplication of scenes and the resulting complex memorial system Freud maps out in the final chapter of the studies are driven back further and further into the individual subject's personal prehistory by the impasses and difficulties of Freud's clinical practice, then a system of scenes, a psychical scenography, is elaborated that is governed by a distinctive temporal logic. Freud's name for this is Nachtreglichkeit. This has been translated in the standard edition with a considerable narrowing of meaning as deferred action, <coughs> and recently re uh, retranslated in, in a proposed neologism by Jean Le Planche as afterwardsness. The French translation is après coup. It is at once central to Freud's seduction theory and, I argue, put at risk by it at the same time. <coughs> the schematic representation of acquired hysteria in the studies as we, uh, uh, consists of an initial traumatic moment, one in which an excessively intense and incompatible idea confronts and threatens to overwhelm the ego, leading to its exclusion or repression from consciousness as a separate psychical group. This is followed by an auxiliary moment or moments where the split-off group of representations temporarily returns or converges with consciousness. And this paired set of terms, the traumatic and the auxiliary, <coughs> and the distinction between them, appear first and very briefly in the Neuropsychosis of Defence paper of 94, and then again in the two case studies of Katerina and Miss Lucy R. in the studies. Each time the terms evolve, and in each paper they're slightly different from the way Freud uses them in the previous paper, um, <coughs> as he um, struggles with and, uh, and uh, develops his understanding of, of what is evolving as a more and more complex time sequence. However, I'm not going to cons uh, uh, consider uh, <coughs> those, those two studies, but Miss Lucy R. In, in particular is an absolutely fascinating um, uh, elab elaboration of a complex time structure. But um, because of the uh, issues of time myself, I'm going to cut immediately to the case of Emma, um, <coughs> which uh, appears in part two of the project of the scientific psychology, the part devoted to psychopathology, where the main thesis is a thesis about um, the nature of historical defence. Uh, the case of Emma exemplifies <coughs> the scenic structure of, uh, uh, of uh, a traumatic scene followed by auxiliary scenes <coughs> and the interplay between them. The traumatic consequences of the first scene are only released in the form of a historical symptom as a result of the retrospective action of the second scene back on the reactivated memory traces of the first. Emma's presenting symptom is a phobia or compulsive inability to go into shops alone. She can go in accompanied by others. She traces this to a scene when she was 12 years old when she went into a shop and saw two shop assistants laughing together and then ran away in a state of fright. About this scene, she reports, that she thought that the shop assistants were laughing <coughs> at her clothes and that one of them had pleased her sexually. She'd found him rather attractive. None of the components of this scene, as, she, as remembered, make much sense uh, when put together. That the 12-year-old girl's clothes were laughed at then shouldn't, later on, deter the young adult from going into shops nor would the presence of a companion make any difference to the risibility or otherwise of her dress. Nor, as Freud remarks, does she seem in need of protection, for, as in agoraphobia, the presence even of a small child was enough to make her feel safe. Furthermore, none of these elements seem to have any connection with the fact that one of the assistants pleased her. By contrast to the simple model of trauma and the preliminary communications, here, neither the phobic compulsion nor the form taken by the symptom seem to be explained by the scene in which it first appears and to which it is an inexplicably disproportionate response. <coughs> However, analysis revealed an earlier scene where at the age of eight she had gone to a shop to buy sweets and the shopkeeper had grabbed at her genitals through her clothes. She had gone back a second time, quote, as though she had wanted in that way to provoke the assault, unquote. Freud comments that, <clears throat> a state of oppressive bad conscience is to be traced back to this experience. And in Strachey's translation, the phrase oppressive bad conscience itself appears in inverted commas, as if Freud is quoting Emma. <clears throat> and the inverted commas seem to indicate her own description of her mental state, uh, suggesting uh, the inference as to her motives is her own. Emma herself seems to have inferred that her guilty feelings resulted from her return to the scene. 
the anomalies and disconnections between the elements <coughs> of the later innocent scene, its puzzling traumatic force and the resulting phobia, can only be understood by interpolating the elements of the earlier scene, which Freud does by laying out the two complexes of ideas and affects in a diagram. It's actually not a diagram I find terribly helpful for those of you who know this text um, <coughs> uh, 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 may have experienced as well. Uh, <coughs> and indeed there have been mistakes in its transcription. Although Emma denied having the earlier scene in mind during the later scene, it is the associative links between the two scenes that explain the puzzling traumatic effectiveness of the innocent later one. The links consist in the elements of laughter the assistant's laughter recall for her, the grin with which the shopkeeper carried out his assault, and the similarity of her situation, for she is again alone by herself in a shop with the man behind the counter. The key difference between the two scenes of Freud is that by the later one she had reached puberty. Here she draws the conclusion, he draws the conclusion that, quote, the memory aroused what it certainly was not able to at the time, a sexual release, which was transformed into anxiety. With this anxiety, she was afraid the shop assistants might repeat the assault, and she ran away. Of the traumatic process that produces the hysterical symptom, Freud comments that the memory of the first scene was in a quite different state from that of the second scene. The puzzling sequence of the, of the second scene, shop assistants, laughing, clothes, sexual release, fright, phobia, <coughs> a, a permanent phobia that lasts for years, remains in consciousness but it is unintelligible and incongruous. <coughs> um, the, the scene, that is, the scene of the, uh, of the symptom's emergence doesn't explain the symptom. Uh, the outcome of flight from the danger of assault and the subsequent fear of being in the shop alone are, Freud comments, rationally constructed, except that the only element from the earlier scene that actually enters consciousness was that of the clothes, the foregrounding of the question of clothes. Consequently, Emma constructs a series of false connections um, between the puzzling elements of the later scene in an attempt to rationalise them. So she thinks that the assistants were laughing at her clothes and it was one of them that had given her pleasure. The sequence that makes up the earlier scene, shopkeeper, grinning, assault, clothes, is through a process of displacement substituted for by the apparent in innocuous but overdetermined element of the clothes. The clothes act as a bridge between the two parallel situations of being in a shop alone and the grinning shopkeeper and being in a store with the two laughing shop assistants, transferring the significance of the first situation, whose memory is only now repressed, to the second situation. Freud argues that the process of repression accompanied by pathological symbol formation, the clothes, is provoked by the deferred sexual release made possible by the advent of puberty. He asserts that the sexual release was not part of the child's experience of the original assault. Hence, we have the paradox, quote, of a memory arousing an affect which it did not arouse as an experience because puberty had made possible a different understanding of what was remembered, a different understanding of what was remembered. This is the psychical constellation, as Freud calls it, peculiar to sexual life, that determines the nature of historical repression. Quote, a memory is repressed which has become a trauma by deferred action. Deferred action is, as I've said, Strachey's translation of Uh So that a trauma requires two events and the interplay between them. It's not simply the effect of the, Im of the impact of a single event. <coughs> it's, it's, it's inadequacy, Strachey's translation's inadequacy is clear, from its suggestion of a merely forward linear progression and postponement, as in the old idea of abreaction whereas the logic of Freud's argument actually entails a belated precipitation of the sexual affect and meaning of a primary scene by the retrospective interpretation and, quote, different understanding of what was remembered in the second scene. While Freud claims that this is typical of repression and hysteria, he also generalises this double logic of deferral and retrospection by claiming that every adolescent individual has memory traces which can only be understood with the emergence of sexual feelings of his own. Hence, everyone carries, quote, the germ of hysteria. What distinguishes the small number of actual hysterics from the majority of people is that, quote, they have become prematurely sexually excitable owing to mechanical and emotional stimulation, bracket masturbation, or due to innate disposition. So there's still a residual Charcottian element there. Here Freud tells us 
the weight must fall on the prematureness of the sexual release as the factor that provokes hysterical repression. Freud's reasoning here is significant. Quote, it cannot be maintained that sexual release in general is an occasion for repression. This would once again make repression into a process of normal frequency. Unquote. So that's why he stresses the prematureness of the sexual release, because repression can't be understood as normal. It's clear that at this point, Freud is still working with the notion of repression, and so by implication of the repressed unconscious, as a pathological phenomenon that is not normal, and that what provokes this pathological mechanism that creates the hysterical symptom is what he calls a premature sexual release specific to hysterics. However, this constitutes a puzzling aporia in Freud's argument. He postulates both a deferred sexual release from scene one with the grinning shopkeeper to scene two with the laughing assistants, and a premature sexual release, which can only mean, in scene one, pre-puberty, as the determinants of historical repression. These contradictory statements are repeated cheek by jowl at the beginning of the next section, <coughs> as if they were consistent with each other. Quote, one, that the sexual release was attached to a memory instead of to an experience. Two, that the sexual release took place prematurely. The first statement claims that the sexual release occurred after puberty, while the second statement seems to claim that it occurred before puberty. However, it is the first statement, that of deferred release, rather than the thesis of prematurity, that is central to Freud's attempt to explain how repression, the disturbance of thought by affect, works. In the final section of part two, Freud returns to his larger argument about defense that enables an understanding of how the isolated memory of the first scene of the assault overcomes uh, the ego's defences. In the wake of a painful or distressing experience, he says, quote, it is the ego's business not to permit any release of affect because this at the same time permits a primary process, unquote. The ego's usual strategy for avoiding this is the mechanism of attention, which inhibits the influx of fresh perceptions that might awaken the distressing memory traces. In the case of Emma, clearly a defensive isolation of the first scene had already taken place. However, the rhyme between the two scenes, together with the various associative connections between them, had enabled this isolation of the, of the memory to be breached. Freud describes the result, quote, Attention is normally adjusted towards perceptions, which are what ordinarily give occasion for a release of unpleasure. Here, however, what has appeared is no perception, but a memory, which unexpectedly releases unpleasure, and the ego only discovers this too late. It has permitted a primary process, because it did not expect one." Unquote. The reactivation of the memory traces of the first scene allows a sexual release in the new context of puberty with its new physiological powers and understandings. However, like the fall of Singapore, where defences that were trained on an enemy approaching from the sea were overtaken by an approach overland from behind, here the exciting and distressing representation occurs in the form of a memory, and so from within. Like Singapore, the ego is taken by surprise and from behind. Its defensive reaction against this unexpected traitor within the gates is to strike out the offending memory from consciousness, while partly transferring the sexual release now intensified in the new context of puberty, onto the homologous but innocent later scene, from the grinning shopkeeper to the pleasing assistant, and partly transforming it into anxiety and the apparently unmotivated fear of going into shops alone. As Freud points out, quote, a repression followed by symbol formation has taken place together with the hysterical symptom of the phobia. Hence the paradox of a secondary ego process of defense that behaves in the blind, amnesiac manner of a primary id process. The above argument about the operation of historical <coughs> repression is premised, then, on the thesis of the deferred release of sexual feeling in the form of a memory. <clears throat> and the contrary emphasis on the premature sexual release seems to play no part at all in it. So we are left with this striking but unremarked contradiction in Freud's argument between the deferred and the premature, and, uh, and in all the commentary on the Emma case, including Laplanche, Laplanche's, and I think he was the first theorist um, to pay sustained attention to it. Um, <clears throat> nobody comments on this. This is all the more puzzling because Freud insists in the case of Emma on the absence of any sexual release in the earliest remembered scene. Now, uh, I would argue that there would seem to be a, a real empirical question as to whether the case materials support Freud's claim here. <clears throat> 
Freud's own report of Emma's two visits to the molesting shopkeeper, her quoted words about having a state of oppressive bad conscience, unquote, and her self-reproaches over her second visit, as though she had wanted in some way to repeat the assault, unquote, all suggest that she had in fact experienced a sexual excitation of some kind in the first scene, had sought to repeat it, and then developed guilty feelings about this, well before the later moment of the historical symptom. This would, of course, be in keeping with the later psychoanalytic account of infantile sexuality that would indicate that a child of eight would have passed through a variety of infantile stages of infantile sexual development. <coughs> Freud's theoretical insistence on the necessary prematureness of sexual release as a precondition of historical repression, otherwise repression would be a normal process, <coughs> uh, while denying it in the case of Emma, is really puzzling. This can be only partly explained due to the fact that his formulation of afterwardsness is at this point in the development of his thought tied to a special emphasis on puberty as a crucial threshold before which the sexual preconditions for neurosis must be laid down. This goes with the assumption that pre-puberty is a pre-sexual period, an assumption that will be overturned by the three essays in 1905. It is on these grounds that Strachey, in a contradictory editorial note to this section of the project, dismisses Freud's special psychical constellation, <coughs> i.e. not Chaklikite, as obsolete. I quote, the whole idea had the ground cut from under it by the discovery a year or two later of infantile sexuality and the recognition of the persistence of unconscious instinctual impulses, unquote. Nevertheless, however important Freud's emphasis on puberty as a threshold, the time structure of afterwardsness is not tied intrinsically to a conception of the infantile as asexual. Rather, it is a preliminary description of a temporal dialectic of deferral and retroaction which can operate between different developmental periods and resulting strata of the mind quite other than puberty. Consequently, it has a pertinence in other contexts, as Strachey in effect admits, by noting the reappearance some 20 years later of the motif of afterwardsness in the case of the Wolfman of 1914 to 18, where Freud locates it without any relation to puberty at all as operating between the ages of one and a half and four years. So the recognition of a premature sexual release or affect in Emma's response in the first scene, as I've argued for, um, need not detract from Freud's formulation uh, of the logic of afterwardsness in play between the two scenes. Indeed, the possibility of its sexual valency post-puberty, it might be argued contra Freud, depends precisely on its having had a sexual impact in the moment of its occurrence, albeit of a kind and intensity appropriate to the child's then uh, premature state of development. Freud's contradictory insistence on the absence of sexual excitation or affect in the first scene is perhaps due to his concern with the complexity of the, sec of the activity going on in the second in so-called innocent scene and to a desire to affirm the determining power of the second scene in order for it to be more than merely an argent a vanishing argent provocateur releasing an inherited predisposition, as with Charcot. However, it remains possible to maintain <coughs> Freud's formulation that the first scene had an effect as memory acting unconsciously from scene two onwards, which it did not have as an experience without it entailing the assumption of childhood asexuality. The structure of deferral bears not on the absolute absence or presence of a sexual release in scene one, but on the belated production of the traumatic drama and its hysterical outcome in scene two. As we've seen with the auxiliary scenes in the studies, it's only in this second moment that simultaneously repression sets in and the phobic symptom appears from then on as a defensive transformation. The significance of Freud's emphasis on puberty is not just the assumption that puberty initiates the biological advent of sexuality in a previously non-sexual being. This was already being challenged by his awareness of the germs of hysteria in the pre-puberty child. More important is the new understandings and ideas that come into play at puberty that retrospectively transform and reinterpret the memories of the first event. <coughs> Now, the status of the first scene in the interval between the two events <coughs> remains unexplored in Freud's account. Uh, Laplanche, who was the first psychoanalytic theorist to recognise the crucial nature of the Emma case and the larger argument about defence of which it's part, comments, quote, we may legitimately ask what the psychical status of that first scene is. 
it would seem that for Freud it persists neither in a conscious state nor, properly speaking, in a repressed state. He remains, therefore, waiting in a kind of limbo, in a corner of the preconscious. The crucial point is that it is not linked to the rest of psychical life. Although the experience gives rise to an oppressive bad conscience, straight away, in Emma's own words, <coughs> um, the, scene, the, the memory of the scene has not been repressed, and it doesn't seem to function as a symptom. The memory of this first scene persists in a defensively isolated state, a kind of limbo, or in storage, as Freud says in the, in the study of Katerina, as an untranslatable, unassimilated foreign body, until it is reactivated in the second scene that translates it into a new post-puberty context where it becomes actively present and thus provokes repression by the ego. Now, I have interpreted the contradiction, as I've called it, between the deferred and the premature in the Emma case <coughs> presentation as resulting from the different gravitational pulls exerted by the different scenes and moments within the temporal schema of afterwardsness. Beginning with a simple model of trauma in the preliminary communication of 93, <coughs> that privilege the moment of the symptom's emergence as the determining moment, Freud encounters a multiplication of scenes that complicates the question of etiology in unexpected ways. However, he addresses these issues in the framework, uh, and this is in the Seduction Theory papers of 96, the published papers of 96. <coughs> he addresses this within the framework of an etiological model that he inherits from Charcot, and from his quarrel with Charcot's hereditarian theory. And this etiological framework acts as a constraint on his discovery and exploration of afterwardsness and on the temporality of trauma entailed by the very multiplication of such scenes. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, the 1896 papers because um, <coughs> I want to finish with a, a brief account of the fantasy-memory relation um, in, the in the letters to Fleece. Um, I'll simply say that um, Freud is struggling in those papers with two, he's got two conceptual schemes, one, that, one that's evolved from the Emma case, um, uh, the schema of Nachträglichkeit, and the other is this etiological model, um, which is uh, uh, ultimately historians of ideas tell us derived from Aristotle um, via Charcot, um, and they interfere with each other in the 1896 papers in ways that, that, they, that one can trace and spell out. However, Freud is struggling, as it were, with a certain experience, uh, if you like, an, a clinical anomaly or paradox, <coughs> um, that is, even after patients have gone through the scenes uh, that they reproduce in the analytic session, uh, in a convincing manner, that is to say, with violent sensations of which they are ashamed, of which they try to conceal, with emotions that seem appropriate to the scene, um, they still attempt to withhold belief from them by emphasising the fact that unlike what happens in the case of other forgotten material, they have no feeling of remembering the scenes, unquote. As we have seen, Freud had confronted this paradox in the studies on hysteria when describing the intensification of resistance as the analysis approaches the pathogenic nucleus of the memorial system, quote, we come across memories that the patient disavows even in reproducing them, unquote. For Freud, this constituted a sign of authenticity, conclusive proof that the patients had not fabricated these scenes, for as he asked, why would patients assure me so emphatically of their unbelief if what they want to discredit is something that they themselves have invented? So the, there's an appeal here to the emotional hallucinatory enactment of scenes as a criterion of their authenticity as memories. <coughs> um, and he says, I have never yet succeeded in forcing on a patient a scene I was expecting to find in such a way he seemed to be living through it with all the appropriate feelings. This, of course, right, um, gradually uh, uh, an element comes into play in Freud's thought, and this is what I want to end with, uh, from the letters to Fleece um, in the months immediately before the September letter, on the question of fantasy. Uh, and uh, the question of fantasy uh, progressively undermines Freud's appeal to um, the, the, authentic the authenticity of the living out uh, of enacted um, emo intensely emotional hallucinatory scenes. So this final section of my paper um, is called Memory in the Key of Fantasy, and that phrase, key at the key of fantasy, comes from one of the letters to Fleece. Now these two terms, memory, or the real event of which it is the subjective record, and fantasy, 
have unfortunately been polarised as mutually exclusive alternatives in most of the retrospective commentary on Freud's seduction theory, including and starting with Freud's own. In the letter of the so-called turning point in September, Freud gives Fleece one of his four reasons for questioning his theory, quote, there are no indications of reality in the unconscious, so that one cannot distinguish between truth and fiction, that is, truth and fiction that has been cathected with affect. Sexual fantasy invariably seizes on the theme of the parents, unquote. However, in the period between the last of the published seduction papers of 96 and Freud's private rejection of the theory, um, to flee since September 97, and it is a temporary rejection only. Um, within months, he's back there again, working through it. Freud had elaborated an, a, a quite complex account of the role of fantasy as part of his theory of traumatic seduction, rather than as an alternative to it. In one of the earliest indications of the emerging significance of fantasy in the letters to Fleece, Freud significantly couples fantasy with precisely the deferred logic of afterwardsness. Quote, the point that escaped me in the solution of hysteria lies in the discovery of a different source. What I have in mind are hysterical fantasies which regularly, as I see it, go back to things that children overhear at an earlier age and understand only subsequently, nachträglich. The age at which they take in information of this is, strangely enough, six to seven months onwards. The articulation of the two terms, fantasy and afterwardsness, is as yet unclear. <clears throat> Barely a month later, Freud is attempting to clarify these interrelations in drafts L, M and N, sent to Fleece and their accompanying letters. Throughout May 97, Freud returns again and again to the role of fantasy, which assumes increasing importance in relation to what he calls my proto-hysteria scenes. Quote, everything goes back to the reproduction of scenes. Some can be obtained directly, others always by way of fantasies set up in front of them. The fantasies stem from the things that have been heard but understood subsequently. And he uses that formulation again and again. And all this material is, of course, genuine. They are protective structures, sublimations of the facts, embellishments of them, and at the same time, they serve for self-relief. Their accidental origin is perhaps from masturbation fantasies. In this passage and the accompanying draft L, there is the same imperative characteristic of the 96 papers to reach the earliest sexual scenes. That's Masson's translation. Freud's term in both the letter and the draft um, is Erzenen, translated in the standard edition as primal scenes and used here for the first time in Freud's work. Unlike its current psychoanalytic usage, which is actually very different from Freud's own usage of this term, to refer to a particular content, the scene of parental intercourse, either directly witnessed, overheard, or imagined by the child. Here in Freud's usage, primal scene signifies the first originary sexual scenes, regardless of specific actors or contents, doesn't necessarily involve the parents at all. Scenes <coughs> that are merely the first stage in a longer and more complex temporal process. You can't have a primal scene by itself. Primal scene is always the first moment uh, in Freud's usage of a larger, longer, more complicated temporal sequence. While in a few cases these scenes can be accessed directly, access to them seems mainly to require, quote, a detour via fantasies, for the fantasies are psychic facades produced to bar access to these, mem to these traumatic memories. They are both protective structures with a function of defence against the memories and a site of sexual excitation and discharge. Freud stresses, again, their deferred relation to things heard, <coughs> uh, as well as their hybrid nature, but they combine things experienced and heard, past events from the history of parents and ancestors, and things that are seen by oneself. Both draft M of the 25th of May and draft N of the 31st of May stress the role of fantasy as the mediating facade of memories. The draft L letter had proposed that the building blocks, um, which I'll skip that sentence, um, in draft N, under the heading of the relation between impulses and fantasies, Freud raises by contrast the possibility of assigning an originary power to fantasy itself. Quote, Memories appear to bifurcate. One part of them is put aside and replaced by fantasies. Another accessible part seems to lead directly to impulses. Is it possible that later on impulses can also derive from fantasies? Where the draft L letter had proposed that impulses arise from primal scenes, that is to say the, the direct memory of, of scenes, here draft N postulates impulses that derive from fantasies. 
It is Laplanche who recognised the potential significance of this sequence and its implied conceptual model. Sketch, quote, sketched out but left in his bottom drawer by Freud himself, unquote. It implies an alternative causal sequence. Um, yes, I put it on the, sh on the handout, actually. Um, draft L and draft N. Um, <coughs> uh, which is different from a realist conception of traumatic memory. Where there was event one to event N, giving rise to a memory which is repressed, which then gives rise to a symptom. And it's very different from uh, later forms of biological determinism, where we get a somatic source consisting of a biological need and an instinctual reflex leading to instinctual activity uh, that then expresses itself in fantasy, where fantasy is the efflorescence of the instincts arising from somatic sources. Instead, what we have is a sequence that goes event giving rise to a memory which gives rise to a fantasy, a defensive fantasy, which gives rise to impulses that are repressed and give rise to symptoms. And it's very similar to the stru time structure in the Beating Fantasies essay of 1919 and the kind of role assigned there to um, the second moment of the Beating Fantasy that is never consciously remembered. In a period prior to the elaboration of the theory of the drives of Trieb in the three essays of 1905, Freud's term is not Trieb but Impulser in German, which marks the site of a proto-drive, a wishful impulse whose source would be neither directly a traumatic memory as such nor a biological need, but a fantasy whose action it would be. I wonder if I should stop at this point. I've got one more passage from the letters, but I've, I've, I've probably been talking for at least 50 minutes. Right. Have a look. Yes, I was just asking you to confirm my time. Yep. Thank you very much. So, um, is, my concluding point then is yes. that fantasy is playing here a role internal to the theory of seduction, not as, his, as Freud himself in his letter of repudiation and his commentators ever since have dramatised it, as an alternative um, to uh, the model of trauma. But fantasy is a, a crucial internal element to the more complex evolving time structure of, of trauma. And uh, the role he assigns to fantasy as the um, emerging out of the decomposition and recomposition of, of, of memory material, as it were, leads directly into the formulation of screen memories, as it were. And the whole um, problematic of screen memories uh, is a replay in displaced form um, of this never-ending argument going on in Freud's thought um, uh, of trauma and the role of trauma, as it were, conceived in an increasingly uh, uh, more complex way with a more elaborated time structure uh, and um, with a role assigned to fantasy, as it were, as crucial to it. So, as it were, the trauma model lives on uh, under, under uh, a different name and a different heading. And one can actually trace the movement of that conceptual complex in Freud's work right through the period in which, as it were, officially trauma has been abandoned and he's moved from a trauma model of, uh, of pathology to a drive-based model of, of sexual development in general, as it were. Uh, and appears to have repudiated as an error, actually that conceptual complex never goes away. Uh, and it's continually at work in a range of texts. The screen memories, uh, uh, absolutely in the Leonardo case, um, very explicitly in the Wolfman case, um, uh, uh, and in various other, uh, the 1919 Beyond the Pleasure Principle, and once again in the, Mo the Moses book right at the end of his life. So that, that, you know, the trauma complex, the com conceptual complex in Freud returns again and again and again. That's, that's my major thesis. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, I must thank you for an extremely scholarly paper, um, which I think you've amply demonstrated that any simple-minded idea of the relation between trauma and uh, uh, time and uh, symptom uh, is uh, um, uh, mistaken. And indeed, the Freud, to some extent, um, doesn't always represent his own ideas with the subtlety and complexity that is to be found in them. Now, um, we have a few minutes for questions. I wonder if questioner could identify themselves. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Tiki Martel. Yes, indeed, you presented a scholarly paper. And you mentioned false connection briefly regarding Emma. Is, is she the Emma Bonnell that... Uh... No. 
No, it's not. No, so, I, so I, I, yeah. I, I'm saying that straight away. Yeah, I should, because I shouldn't. that's what Freud mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Connection. No, it's not and taken from that case no, study okay. in the studies. Fine, I wanted to, make it to verify that. And also for false connection, is it possible that it is when the ego creates pathways to outwit the superego? Well, uh, the concept superego isn't isn't formulated at this point in Freud's... Yes, but uh, later on he mentioned uh, it. I mean, it, when he's... It, he's what, it's a defensive. <coughs> it's a kind of almost automatic defensive um, uh, uh, procedure. He talks about false connections uh, quite a lot in um, the studies on hysteria. That's right. Uh, and um, it's a way of uh, making sense of... Um, well, in, 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 the case, in the Emma case... Um, and I think actually the Emma case... I may be wrong about this. I think the Emma case in the, that I talked about is not Emmy von N, but is um, Emma Eckstein. But I may be wrong about that. But that, that's a minor point. Um, it's a way for Emma to make sense of the fact that um, the elements of the scene she does remember, the, the, the scene in the store with the two laughing shop assistants, to which she, she traces back her phobia about going into shops. So that's the scene of the symptoms first emergence. And in the earlier model of trauma, that would therefore be the origin, the cause. Um, it, it's clearly not the case, because the scene doesn't explain the symptom. And her attempt to rationalise the fact that there are all these elements she wants to tell Freud about in that scene, and they don't fit together terribly well, they don't make sense. OK, they laughed at her clothes when she was a 12-year-old. Why should that stop her going into, into shops as a 22-year-old, as it were? Um, and why should she feel better about it if she has a child accompanying her? wouldn't make her clothes any less laughable. And what's that got to do with the fact that actually she rather fancied one of the young men in the shop at the time? Uh, uh, you know, all of this, and, and she can't go in by herself. I mean, the elements don't fit together, as it were, and the intense phobic reaction that she has, which, which she lives with for years and years afterwards, doesn't make sense in relationship to that. So, but she, attempt, she attempts to make full connect, explanatory connections, um, and Freud's... Um, uh, uh, argument is that the one element from the from the scene that is repressed at that point, um, the earlier scene of a sexual assault by the shopkeeper, is the element of the clothes, as it were, and the clothes then are foregrounded as um, you know this is what they're laughing at. This is why I can't go into shops, you know, alone. She doesn't consciously give the explanation. I'm frightened of being sexually assaulted, right? It's to do with an embarrassment about clothes. Right, which, which again doesn't make much sense. After all, she's a young woman now, and she can go into shops and she can choose her own clothes. She's undressed by her mother, etc., etc. You know, so the elements are rationalised, as it were, through a series of false connections. Julia, it occurred to me, though, as as you're uh, as you're talking as well, is that part of what uh, Freud might have been struggling with uh, is the need to find a fix, uh, a comp common ground between all these stories. And that's something that, uh, that that's a, because all these all these different scenes are so are infinitely variable and, and very particular to each case in point. But also Freud and psychoanalysis itself uh, just needs needs the common ground. And if it's not puberty, puberty may be a common ground. But that's unacceptable as as you uh, as you explained yourself very convincingly problems with that too, but he never quite perhaps solved his satisfaction by the question of the common ground. And he came up with you mean, of what different all, solutions. Of what all traumatic scenes might have in common. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess my argument is that it's not, con it's not simply a content that they have in common, but it's a temporal structure. It's one of the things they have in common, the one crucial thing they have in common, as it were. And it's a temporal process, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the specificity of the term er, zener, or primal scene, belongs, you know. And we've kind of lost that in contemporary psychoanalytical language because it's just used to refer to reference a content. You know, a primal scene is something between the parent that the child overhears or sees or fantasizes about or whatever, as it were. Whereas for Freud, a primal scene is a temporal structure and the content can be variable. So that, that gets us out of all kinds of all, all kinds of dis difficulties that, that's associated with the this conflict, for example, if that's the common ground. Um, right. So yes. temporality is general enough to an abstract enough that could be that, 
that, that it could that it could work outside our our specific cultural context and it's, it's much more adaptable. Yes. Uh, would you agree? He doesn't I mean he thinks the scene with the parents is crucial. Mm -hmm. Um and I've tried to, to trace through um, just where he uses the term primal scene and where he doesn't. And he talks again and again about the importance of the parental scene in, in uh, the interpretation of dreams. In that wonderful little paper, I think it's uh, 1915, of the paranoid woman, um, where he actually first produces the, the, the notion of primal fantasy. Um, and he says there, the scene with the parents is a primal fantasy. He doesn't call it an erzena at that point. It's only he picks up the term again with the Wolfman case, and it's because of the Wolfman case that, it's, that I think the current usage of it to refer to a specific parental content has, has given rise. But even in that case, he's not using it in that way. He's using it quite explicitly, um, but because people have lost, um, uh, or, or psychoanalysis have kind of lost the, the temporal specificity of the trauma model, people don't see how the term is functioning in the Wolfman case. And it is functioning precisely um, to reference this, this question of temporal process or temporal structure, not merely um, to reference parental. And I think if you, this is what I haven't done, um, I've only really quite worked that out myself very recently, thinking about the Wolfman case. Um, I, 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 and so I haven't gone on to check um, in the German where Freud uses the term Erzena. The standard edition is very unhelpful here, because if you look up primal scene, what it references is a whole series of of passages in Freud in which the word primal scene does not appear, um, but are referenced simply because the parents appear. So that equation, primal scene equals parents, has become so automatic and unthinking that, if, that in the index to the to the standard edition, you know, you'll get re referred to passages and passages all over the place where, where Freud is not using the key word azana. You know, he's just talking about the parental scene, as it were. So uh, actually, tra tra tracking it down is quite. <coughs> quite tricky because this, the conceptual specificity of that temporal process and of the term primal scene has been lost. Uh, yes? Um, just a very brief question. I'm wondering whether or not it's possible to revisit this Freudian concept of the primal scene and the trauma in terms of contemporary theories of the origin of trauma, and in which case the the, the triangulation scene where the young woman is humiliated and feels herself excluded in what is a kind of primal scene structure where two people are laughing at her and she's outside of them is in a sense a defensive structure that defends her or the subject against this far more disturbing dyadic structure earlier where she is alone with an adult who is in some sense too powerful either sexually or aggressively and whether or not this would, something that would be understood really much more in terms of our contemporary understanding of the relationship between the pre oedipal as a time of extreme vulnerability and then the Oedipal moment, the triangulation moment, is a defense against that against structural yeah. fantasized, organized defense against the much more inarticulate representation of something that occurred before. Yes, well, it's difficult with the, with with a you know a, a case study if um, you know you only got a certain amount of material offered by in the presentation. Um, so I I would hesitate to try and map it onto questions of the eatable and the pre eatable. Not least because she's eight years old in the earlier scene. Uh, okay, so or, you know make that what you will, as it were. Um, what uh, my thought about the second scene is that it's, it's presented by Freud as, as innocent uh, and asexual, uh, and by most commentators take that. But it does seem to me, you know, a young girl um, uh, you know, on the threshold of puberty going into a, a shop, and, she, and, she, and some young men are staring at her, looking at her, maybe laughing together, uh, you know, that, that that could well be a sexual scene, and that, you know, there is a sexual element floating around. Uh, it's a not uncommon kind of scene that she's been she's being looked over or given the eye or something like that, and that produces this this intense reaction. So it may well be that the second scene, on the basis of just the descriptions we have of it, um, isn't as innocent uh, as is normally being assumed. I mean, it's a, it would be a not uncommon sort of you know, experience, I, I imagine, for a young girl to be uh, on the receiving end of a kind of uh, a, a praising or joking 
male gaze. Um, so th there may well be some dimension like that. Um, I don't think that uh, that would just kind of feed into or colour in um, uh, the structure uh, that Freud's talking about, as it were. Um, uh, that there's something provoking in the scene uh, that, prov that provokes even more the, the emergence of the earlier scene. Uh, 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 again, Freud, I mean, this is Freud's sort of relatively, it's not exactly his earlier stage of thinking about these things. It's, it, there is a kind of real conceptual breakthrough in the Emma case, I think, in relationship to the way he's thought about trauma elsewhere. I mean, an, an equivalently rich case, and I just hadn't, didn't have time to present it, um, is the Miss Lucy R case, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And there are three different scenes that are played, are played together. Uh, or actually, a lot more. Freud has a, uh, as a, what he calls an etiological formula to explain um, the hysterical um, symptom in the case of Miss Lucy R. There's a traumatic scene, a first auxiliary scene, and then a second auxiliary scene. But the, but the presenting material is so rich that actually it's very clear that there's a, there are two other crucial scenes as well that Freud just mentions in passing gives rather vivid details that have come from his, his patient, um, but doesn't, think, doesn't interrogate, as it were. Um, so actually, it's a really quite complex scenic structure there. Um, but at that point, he do, he's not pushing himself to think, to conceptualize it in the way he does in the Emma case. Uh, but it's, it's, even more, it's even richer, I think, as a case. Um, uh, but, I, you know, it just it takes quite a present, while to present it, <laughs> so, so I kind of didn't do it. Um, but it's, it's a rather wonderful case to think of in relationship to the Emma case. And it, it appears, of course, in the case studies that are published in 95, but it would have been written up um, uh, rather earlier, in either 93 or 94, I think. Mm. Well, it's... Uh, yes, Iris? Yeah. The term seduction hasn't really come up. And I'm interested in the notion that fantasies and impulses are so very, very early. And that these fantasies and impulses can, as it were, lead to a kind of self-seduction, which is then played out in subsequent scenes. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what connection to make between that and... Well, I was thinking about your paper in New Formations on the Parshish theories. Right. And that the infant is not a blank slate. Sure. The infant has enormous impulses and fantasies combined and is creating his or her own scenario. Yes. And specifically, very strong desires. Yes, the fact, I mean, in terms of what Laplanche does with this material, um, the fantasy is very much um, a moment um, in which the small recipient uh, of, of highly charged um, material, um, gestures, uh, behaviours, um, both vocal and, uh, uh, and non-vocal, coming from the parent, are, as it were, processed and, and uh, translated um, and bound um, through a process of fantasy which involves self-representation. Um, uh, and he sees that he sees different moments in Freud's writing where some intuition of that is being played out. There's a letter of December of December '96 where a model of translation is actually briefly elaborated by Freud uh, in a rather interesting way, um, in which for every translation there is always a remainder, something that is untranslated, so that the fantasies that are produced, uh, which are defensive and also self-representational. Um, uh, also don't, can't handle, can't cope with, can't process certain elements that have come to them from the, from the adult. Um, and that is excluded, and that's part of their job, is to, in some sense, exclude what, what can't be processed. Now, for Laplanche, that is the beginning of the unconscious. That's where the drives begin. They originate in that process of translation, self-representation, fantasy, and what, and what is excluded by the fantasy, what is on the other side of the fantasy. So he's interested in, as it were, a, a non-biological theory of the trebe as distinct from instincts. The trebe is not a biological instinct, 
as, as it were. It's, it's something that repeats from um, the material, the non-translated material that has fallen out of the fantasy. Well, um, before breaking for coffee, because we are not on time, but uh, it's coffee's only next door, I'd just like to make a brief uh, comment from an anthropological point of view. The, the idea of recasting, of re-remembering the past in terms of the present is very familiar to an anthropologist because mm. that's his whole theory of myth, the, the Malinowski theory of myth. Um, I have a bit of problem with the fact that in all Freud's case histories that I've read, um, the, the origin of everything goes back to the primal scene. The origin of uh, trauma goes back to the, pri to the primal scene, even though the primal scene is understood in a continuous way and in a two-part whatnot. Now, uh, uh, my, um, my work was done in India. Uh, children live in, stay in the mother's bed, at least for the first few years of life. So exposure to the primal scene is for them a regular occurrence. And uh, I don't know that it quite has the traumatic implications which uh, you seem to, or Freud seems to, attribute to it. Yes. Well, I'd like to just say two things in response to that. One is, um, I, I'm trying to, um, as it were, disintricate the concept of primal scene from the notion of a parental scene. Um, yes. Primal scene may or may not involve a parental scene. Um, um, and also, in a way, um, the implications um, of this, uh, which Freud does moment, at different moments take up, and which are taken up explicitly by, by Laplanche and, and, and other theorists, is that there isn't a neat separation between the traumatic and the normal. That there is, you know, the so-called normal development, developmental process um, is, is itself traumatic, has a traumatic dimension to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not that everything's trauma, but there, you can't, there, there isn't this nice, clear cut. Um, there's, there are these poor traumatised folk over here, and there's those of us who've been lucky to escape all traumas and to have a nice, smooth, developmental stage-by-stage -stage transition. You know, we passed the anal phase and moved on to the genital phase and <laughs> passed that with flying colours and, you know, <laughs> moved on to the Oedipus, as it were, like our kind of uh, level for GCSE or something, you know. Um, that there is a, there is a tra traumatic counter-logic at work in what might look like you know, a nice, smooth, developmental ascension up to maturity, as it were. In other words, we're all neurotic. <laughs> on this happy note, <laughs> we're all, we all carry the germs yes, of trauma. Perhaps we said. could have some coffee. <laughs> and uh, um, we, perhaps you could uh, endeavour to assist.